The text that I will be、uh, sharing with you is the gospel text that we read today from Matthew chapter six, verse nineteen to thirty-four. All right. Now, before we go into the text, there, I want to ask you a question, similar to what I asked the little kids earlier. What are you gonna be when you grow up? Right. That was the question for the little kids. Now all of you grew up, right? You grew up, so the question changed. What are you living for? Let's take a moment. Think about that. Okay. Close your eyes and say and think about what am I living for right now? All right. Now. To simplify that question even more would be, why are you working hard right now? For those of you who are still in school, why are you studying hard? And then for the rest of us, why are you worried so much about money? Why are you worried so much about what you will eat, what you're gonna drink, what you're gonna wear? And how much can I store up for myself here on Earth while I'm still alive? You know, I've been asking these questions of Christians across the United States when I visit them, and all of them, I would say 99% of them, answer the, these questions the following way: I am working hard because I want to take care of my family. I'm study hard because I want to take care of my family, right? Get a degree, get a good job, take care of my family. I worry so much about money because I want to make sure my family is taken care of, right? And if I come down there and I ask you these questions, why are you working hard? Why are you studying hard? Why are you worry so much about money? I'm pretty sure that you will say the same thing. I want to take care of my family, right? That is a very normal answer, and that is how normal people live life. We want to take care of family, but brother, sister in Christ, Jesus did not call us to live normal lives. You know that. In your baptism, you no longer normal. You became a child of God. Now let me ask you: How many of your parents? Raise your hand. You parents. If you are parents, okay. Ah,、right, okay. Good, good. We lots of parents. How many of you parents raise want to raise lazy children? Raise your hand. Your goal is to raise lazy children. None. It is the same. God's goal is not to lay to raise lazy children. You know that. In your baptism, God said, "I love you so much. Now you are my child. I have work for you to do. I entrusted to you the message of reconciliation, and you to live your life for that purpose." Right? And here we are. We are Christians. We live life worrying about what we're gonna eat, what we're gonna drink, what we're gonna wear, and how much can we store up for ourselves. And leave it for our children as well. Those are the word of God says. The pagans go after that. The Gentiles go after that. The non-Christians live life that way. But the word of God says we are not to live life that way. So what are we supposed to live? When that those questions ask of us, why are you working hard? We should say, we should respond this way. I am working hard because I want to serve the Lord. Think about that. I'm study hard because I want to serve the Lord. I'm worried about money because I want to serve the Lord. Okay. None of the Christian I ask have ever answered these questions this way. And do you know why? Because most of us Christians, God is the master of our souls, but He is not the master of our lives.、Right? Most Christians don't even go to church. You know that. 
Do you know why they don't go to church? Because they worry about what they're going to eat, what they're going to drink, what they're going to wear, and they don't have time for God. That's why they don't go to church. Huh? That's why we have lots of pews empty. Huh? And they're not all at the cemetery, all right? <laughs> they all just worry about life, and they don't have time for God. Huh? And, and most Christians who go to church, okay, they don't pay attention to what they're singing. How many hymns do we sing today? And what was the themes of the hymns today? Christ alone, right? Cornerstone. Christ it is, okay? But we walk out the door and no more Christ alone. He's not the cornerstone anymore, okay? We don't pay attention. Now, I'm really going to put you guys on the spot, okay, to see if you really pay attention. Who preached the sermon last Sunday? Last Sunday, who preached? Raise your hand, if you remember. Who preached? Missionary. missionary. Exactly. What's the name of the missionary? Yeah. That's the right. Oh, a missionary. Yeah. <laughs> Pastor, right? Okay. What what the what was okay. okay? What was the text passed the message on? Who remembered the text? Raise your hand. Okay. Pastor, look at that. Who remembered the text that passed the message based on? Raise your hand. Okay, see Pastor? Okay. Now, all right, good, good. One person. Okay. What what his message about? If you remember his message, what is it about? Raise your hand. Pastor, look at look at only two people. Alright, alright. Now, what did you do with his message for the past six days? Did you live it out? And how did it go? How many live out the message for the past six days? Raise your hand. Uh, Pastor, you know. You don't have to worry too hard a message, you know, the sermon. Yeah, they don't pay attention to that. Yeah, just come and read the text and say, God bless you. And then you can spend those time, you know, that you pray and pr prepare the text. Use those time for other pastoral care work. It's more effective that way. Okay? So don't worry to, to work too hard on the message. People don't pay attention. Huh? But I hope and I pray that today and for the future, you will pay attention to the Lord's message that pastor preached. Okay? Because it is not for you to judge if your pastor is doing his job. You know that? It is not for you to judge if your pastor still remember his theological training and make sure that the message is theologically correct. Don't, that's not the point. Okay? The point is he expounded the message to you in very simple English that you can live out. Okay? That you can live out. That's the, the way we ought to come to church. Now, for those that come to church and pay attention, most of them don't even read the Word of God. You know that? Most of them don't even read the Word of God. They let pastor read the Word of God and elder read the Word of God to them and for them. And for those that read the Word of God, guess what? They don't even believe in the Word of God. They read the Word of God, they say, Hmm. I don't believe that. Okay? Let me prove that to you. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 to 34. Do you believe the word of God? Pay attention. And you will say, I don't believe the word of God. Because for most Christians, Matthew 6, verse 19 to 34, it is one of the most challenging passages in the Word of God. Because they say, you know, God said, don't worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to wear, and don't store up for yourself treasure on earth. 
And people will say, if we don't worry about those things and we don't take care of ourselves, how are we going to live? Right? And God said that because, you know, He doesn't understand the reality of life, you see. Life is difficult. Life is challenged. Life struggles. And we have to worry about what we're going to eat, what we're going to drink, what we're going to wear, and how much can we store up to take care of family. We need to save money for a rainy day. And if we don't do that, who is going to take care of family? And how are we going to clothe them and feed them? So God must be out of his mind. Therefore, we become Christians who worry about these things. And this led us to become like the non-Christians who put the worries of life first instead of seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Instead of laid up or stored up treasures for ourselves in heaven, we stored up treasure for ourselves on earth. This means our eyes become blinded by the worries of life. We don't see God and only God as our true security, hope, peace, and joy. We let money and greed become the masters of our lives and the master of our souls. We live life in our own realities, right? And we don't live in God's blessed life for us. You see, in our own reality of life, we struggle, we fight, okay? And then we get hurt. And then we didn't get what we want. And guess what? We blame God. And we say, God, look at you promised in Jeremiah 19. You said, I have a wonderful future for you, not to harm you, but a future with hope. And look at what happened to me, God. You are not fulfilling your promise to me. And God, look at you, and God is going to say, I am so sorry. I am so sorry I failed you, right? No. God's going to look at you, and God's going to say, you living in your own realities of life. And that's why you struggle. You refuse to obey. You refuse to trust my word that I promise you that I will give you what you need. But there's a condition in there, and you forgot that condition. Okay? In our reality of life, we struggle alone. We struggle alone without God because we trust ourselves. We trust our own effort. We trust the, the things that we see and the desire of our hearts. But in God's blessed life, He said, trust God about all things. Trust Him. When we live in our reality of life, we let money become the treasure that we work hard to get and we hold fast to it. Okay? Money becomes the things that we put our hope and security in and money becomes the things that we look for to bring, our, to bring us comfort, hope, peace, joy, and happiness and security. God then becomes an afterthought for us. Okay? If all these things doesn't work out, then we talk to God. Okay? God becomes the last thing in your mind. This is exactly what Jesus was afraid that we will be doing and we become. And that's why he said, do not worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to wear, and how much you can lay out treasure for yourself on earth. And that's why he said, you cannot serve God and money. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. Jesus also further said, do not lay it up for yourself treasure on earth, but lay it up for yourself treasures in heaven. Okay? Jesus did not say, do not have anything to do with money or treasure. He did not say that. But he said, do not lay it out. Do not hoard it. Do not keep it for yourself. Do not store it up for yourself. But use it. 
Use it for His glory. Use the treasure. Use the money you have to bring the gospel to the people around the world. And you and I, we know that we cannot buy salvation with money. But we can certainly send missionaries, send the word of God through the treasure we have around the world. You have heard that salvation is a free gift. But mission is very expensive. Do you know how much it costs to do mission work? Think about that. How much it costs to do mission work? Well, a simple way of looking at it is this. It costs Jesus' life in the mission field. So he entrusts that mission of seeking and saving the lost to us now, and it will cost us. Mission required sacrifices. It will require you to, mess up, to make sacrificial giving and pray and engaging in the mission of God. It is also required of us who are missionaries to the point of even giving up our lives for the mission. As a foreign missionaries, foreign missionaries, most foreign missionaries will be an honor to die in the mission field. And we have to say yes to that before we sign up to be a foreign missionaries. You know, last year alone, we spent over $230,000 in the mission field. This, this past 12 months, we spent about $230,000. And here's the result of it. 36,835 individuals heard the good news. 1,730 individuals came to faith. 1,283 individuals were baptized. And we started 32 new ministries and helped build five new church buildings in Southeast Asia. We cannot do all these things without you. Your church has become this partner in this work of the Lord. Many of you are individually, financially supporting the Lord's work through our family. So thank you for partnering with us so we can have these statistics to share and to celebrate. Now some of you may say $230,000 in, in 12 months, that's a lot of money, right? But if you look at it from God's perspective, it is nothing, okay? But if you look at it from our worry of life, okay, that's a lot of money. God's perspective is this. How much does it cost to get one person to be baptized? And God said, my son's life, okay? It costs Jesus' life for one baptism. And so it's priceless. So spend $230,000 to get all those individuals heard the gospel, came to faith, be baptized. It's a miracle. And truly, the Lord is working miracle through all of us. We have to raise every single penny to do the Lord's work. And our budget is about $150,000 a year. Now, that was our budget, but we went over that in our spending, right? In any normal organization, we would say we were not very good at spending, right? We went over our budget. But you see, we are not working with an ordinary organization. We are working for the heavenly kingdom. And that's our uh, budget. That's our vision. But the Lord said, you know, we have, I have more work for you to do. And so the more work we do, the more we spend. So last year, the year before, we baptized 649. I thought that was great. And that was why we set the budget that much. But this year, we had the privilege of baptizing over 1,000 people and cost money to get the word of God to people. And so it's such a joy to share with you the needs and the opportunity for you to partner with us. And this is why the question, what are you living for, is so connected to the Lord's work that we are doing in Southeast Asia and your congregation doing right here in Fond du Lac. Okay? How you understand how you live your life 
impact your ministry personally and publicly. Right? So, I pray and hope that you will think hard about what are you living for. You know? And then say, God, you don't want me to worry about that. You don't want me to go after all those things. So now, what do you want me to live for? And the Lord will answer you. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all that you need, he will give it to you. You know, in the Greek text, it does not say seek first, but it actually said above all else, above all, seek his kingdom and his righteousness. One of my college professors and the seminary said, to put a more simple form, it should be seek only his kingdom and his righteousness. There's no first and then last or first and second, but only, seek only his kingdom and his righteousness, and all that you need, the Lord will add on to you, and will give it to you. So, what does that mean? Seek only his kingdom and his righteousness. Now, many people say his kingdom is heaven. Seek king in heaven. No. Seek his kingdom is about his reign. He must be the master of your heart. Okay? Because he's the master of your soul, now he must be the master of your heart. Your heart deals with your life. He must be the master of your life, the master of your heart. God must reign in your heart, and his righteousness must overflow so much inside of you that, that there's no room for you to worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear, what you're going to drink, and how much you're going to have to store up for yourself so that you can take care of your family. You let all that for God to bless you with. This call for total trusting of God and His Word. This means God must be number one in your life. And there, this leads to the first commandment. Right? Thou shalt not have any other gods before thee. Okay? That's it. Matthew 6, verse 19 to 34. It's all about the first commandment. You shall not have any other gods before, before the Lord. You know, if all Christians are living their faith and life with a total trusting of God and His Word, then we all should have joined Mr. Bob Pierce, World Vision's founder, in his prayer. Let my heart be broken with the things that break the heart of God. Now, what are the things that break your heart? Are they correlated to the things that break God's heart? You see, what breaks God's heart in Southeast Asia and here in Fond du Lac and around the world is not how much we're going to save up. Okay? It's not about saving money, but it is about saving souls. Okay? It's about saving souls. What breaks God's heart is that not all people around the world are reconciled to God before they die. Do you know that the world population is about uh, let's see, 8 billion people? And approximately 5.6 billion of them are not yet Christian? That means 5.6 billion of them are still be locked up in sin. In the bondage of sin. Okay? And within one hour, one hour, about 7,000 people around the world would die. And the majority of them die while they're still locked up in sin. Break that down a little bit, even more. Simple. Within one minute, approximately 110 people die around the world and the majority of them die still being locked up in sin. And here we are, Christians, worry so much about what we're going to eat, what we're going to drink, what we're going to wear, and how much we can store up for ourselves. And that is where we miss the point about who we are as Christians. 
You know, God's desire for us is for Him to rule our hearts so much so that He lead us to live out our life as Great Commission people. You know, Great Commission people are who we are. We are not just Christians. We are Great Commission people. Okay? And to live as Great Commission people is hard. It is hard when all you're living for is worry about what you eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to wear, and how much can you store up for you and yourself and your family. You cannot live as Great Commission people by worrying. But living as Great Commission people, it's easy. It's easy when God reigns in your heart and His righteousness is in you. And what you are living for is to serve the Lord. Okay? To serve the Lord as a father. You are not just a father because I have kids. You are a father because God put you there. And you are serving God by being a father. You are serving God by being a mother. You are serving God by being a doctor. You are a doctor there serving God. Not because you are there because you are serving the hospital and the patient, but you are serving the Lord. Okay? You are a janitor. You are serving the Lord. Okay? Not because some company hired you to clean and then you serve them. No, you are serving God through the blessing that the Lord gave to you through that company. So where you are at, you are serving the Lord. Right? God does not say, don't do anything and I'll give everything to you. Right? But when God rules in your heart and His righteousness is inside of you, things change. This song we sang earlier, and I think your prayer too, as we come here, we go out, we change. Okay? And this should be, always be the case. We come in as a sinners, broken, right? And God forgave of our sin, and then we are equipped by the Word of God, go out there, live differently, okay? change. Right? And that's how we are to live. So brothers and sisters in Christ, if the Word of God you heard this morning causes you to say, what shall I do so I can live and serve the Lord? Instead of what shall I eat, what shall I drink, what shall I wear, and how much I can store up for myself? Then my answer to you would be from the Word of God. Repent and trust the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, in all your ways, Acknowledge Him, and He will make straight your path. Okay. Do you hear that? We read the, this passage so fast sometimes, and we totally missed the whole thing. This is a promise right here. God promises us right here. When we trust Him with all our heart, when we lean on Him and not on our understanding, and in our ways, we acknowledge Him. Okay. What does that acknowledge mean? When we live life to serve the Lord, He will make straight our path. Not that our path will automatically be straight, but He will make our path straight. I pray that the Word of God you heard today, and if you forgot the Word of God today, that your baptism gives you the assurance that you have been set apart. Okay? You have been set apart, and God's uh, kingdom has reigned in you, and His righteousness is in you, and you've been set apart to give to Him all your worries okay, and trust Him with your life. And may the Holy Spirit lead you to seek only His kingdom and His righteousness so that you will be able to say, what I'm living for is to serve the Lord all the days of my life. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord may His face shine on you, be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you His peace. Go in peace. And Lutheran, we say, serve the Lord. Okay? God's blessing to you. Speaking words of blessing to one another as well. May the grace 
of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all.